Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Recently, as you know, I was in Oaxaca, Mexico, and uh, we, we've seen the devastation there. There has been earthquake after earthquake. Um, as a matter of fact, yesterday there was another earthquake at the very place I was at, which is called Huchitan. And Huchitan is a uh, small community. Um, and I say small, I mean it's pretty big, but it's 150,000 people live in this community. And there have been over 500 deaths in this community. Um, there's a lot of hurt. I have interviewed people. I have sat with people. I have uh, cried with people. And, uh, and to see their devastation and, and their loss is so heartbreaking because you want to give them everything. You want to rebuild their house for them, which I'm, I'm in talks as well with uh, uh, other ministries and seeing how we can help rebuild. And uh, right now we're strategizing. Uh, so what we did was we set up a board in Huchitan where we have leaders who are, who are taking the finances and, and all of the goods that we're bringing to Oaxaca and we are making sure that everything gets to the people. The government has been very dishonest. As a matter of fact, yesterday in LA Times, um, the, the, the ad came out saying that the government of Mexico uh, does not save its people. It's the people saving its people. And, uh, and it's true because as I was there, uh, first count information, okay, this isn't hearsay, this isn't gossip. I saw government officials taking the food that was coming in from different places around the, the globe and storing them in places and not giving them. And the reason they're doing that is because they want to get political gain because uh, politicians are going to be coming into uh, uh, voting again for their position and they're going to use the food as, as a medium to get people to vote for them. And what's really hurtful and and heartbreaking is that you see all these trucks that are being seized by the government with all these goods knowing that the people need it but don't care about the people they care more about their agenda it 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 hurts and it it's hard not to get angry now it's not a sin to get angry it's a sin to stay angry and do something about that anger in a bad way right be angry but do not sin so i had my moment of anger little ticked off but of course at the end of the day I have to remember my hope is not in the government my hope is in Jesus come on my hope is not in the government my hope is that the church rises and so what's pretty awesome is that as I have been speaking with people there have been people that have been in their rubble literally in their rubble and if you were here last weekend, I, I sent a video. You guys got to see what took place and how you guys were so generous and such a blessing to Oaxaca. And the work has not been finished. Yesterday, there was another earthquake. I got on the phone, spoke to our team. And, and I said, what happened? He's like, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what happened? He said, remember the bridge that you came into town? He said, that bridge has collapsed. It no longer exists anymore. And he said, and there was more deaths today. And so the challenge is, is, is constant. The pain is consistent. But one thing that I respect and I love about these people is that in the midst of the rubble, they have hope. They're saying things like this. You know what? We know that we are in a very bad place. Okay, this is the leadership that I'm speaking to that we've set in place. They said, I know that our, our situation is bad, but we truly believe that our best days are to be. We truly believe that the best days in our life are about to come. And so how do you, how do you make statements like that when you're in the rubble, when you're in the eye of the storm? How is it that you have people like these wonderful people that just experience death, destruction, and have the audacity to say, we believe that our best days are ahead? How do they do that? I'll tell you how. His name is Jesus. See, you either have met the fake Jesus or you've met the real Jesus. See, because once you meet the real Jesus, that's the kind of faith and hope you have. And I truly believe that the best days for Oaxaca, Mexico are about to be. 
the greatest outpouring of God's blessings, the greatest miracles, the greatest breakthroughs, the greatest revivals are going to come out of Oaxaca, Mexico. I truly believe that with all of my heart. We are standing, we're, we're believing, we're praying, we're declaring, we're prophesying. But guess what? There are people here today that came in with their own rubble. You have your rubble of finances that are just struggling you and choking you. You have the rubble of, of health issues. You have the rubble of family problems. Kids gone wild. You have a problem of, of, of relationships. There may be something that you are facing that the rubble is literally bearing you. And I know that when you see things like this across the globe, there, the, the, the temptation is to say th things like this. It's to say, you know what, man, I should stop complaining because these people have it worse than me. Now, let me tell you something. God cares about the smallest little thing of challenge that you're facing right now in your life. God loves you as much as he loves the people that lost everything. God cares about you. Pride would be for you to say, you know what, I'm going to stop complaining and I'm just going to go ahead and just pray for them. No, that's pride because you know what, your God is big enough for Mexico and he's big enough for the USA and he's big enough for the world all at the same time. Amen. He is a big God. He is a great God. He is a God who is majesty is just so impressive. And so hope. I want to talk about hope because I believe that most Christians operate in an unhealthy faith. Unhealthy faith. I hear always people tell me, I don't have faith like you. I'm like, well, sure you do. You just, you just have broken faith. See, the foundation to faith is always going to be hope. If hope is not the foundation, see, you came to Christ with hope. Then you receive faith. God wants to restore hope in your life today. Regardless of what you're facing, God wants to restore hope. Maybe you're just someone that's dealing with oppression. Maybe you're someone that's always sad, you're unhappy. God wants you to hope again. Let me read you a verse in the Bible that is just going to knock the shoes off of your feet. It's going to blow the hair back on your head. And if you have no hair, you're going to grow some today then. Come on, somebody. The hair anointing is in this place. <laughs> Glory to God. No, let me tell you something. Great miracles are taking place. In Oaxaca, in this little town, I sat with the leaders and we, we talked. I met with all kinds of people. But we sat at the table one night about 11 o'clock at night and we were just having some dinner. And uh, they said, you know what, Pastor, there has been some great miracles. And I said, really, what are they? And he said to me, well, before the earthquake, there were one to five murders per day for six years straight. Per day, seven days a week. As a matter of fact, the day before the earthquake, a politician who was dirty was murdered by the cartel. They said this. They're like, here's the miracle. Since the earthquake, there has not been one murder. So how can you see the good in the bad? You have to start seeing that God is working behind the scenes even when you don't sense him. God is healing hearts in Oaxaca. God is restoring, God is redeeming, God is changing some people. And here's why. Go with me to Hebrews 6. It's a phenomenal verse on faith and hope. But I want to read it to you in the, in the nerve version. Check this out. It says, people take oaths by someone greater than themselves. Isn't that the truth? Come on, have you ever sworn your grandma? Like, I swear on my grandma's grave. I swear to you on my mama. I swear, man, I ain't lying to you. We all have sworn on someone greater than ourselves. That's what Paul's saying. Like y'all swear on all these other people that are greater than little you. And check this out. An oath makes a promise certain. It puts an end to all arguing. And how many know that all of the arguments never start with people. All of the arguments always start with your head. They always start in your head. Arguments right here in the cabeza. It's always insane in the membrane. Do you remember that song? <laughs> any 80 people? Any 80s people? <laughs> Crisscross. Cancer. Right. Okay, anyway. <laughs> All the young people are like, what? <laughs> Talk to your parents about that. Uh, 
But, but check this out. The struggle is always going to be in your head. The struggle to have faith. The struggle to have hope. The struggle to believe the best. The struggle to see the best is always going to be a struggle in the head. The argument is always in your head. And so here the scripture says, hey, listen. When an oath and a promise is made, it literally ends all argument. God wants to end the argument of your head right now. He wants to end the, uh, your, the argument of my kids will never come to Jesus. Uh, I'll never make more money. I'll, I'll, I'll never survive with this kind of money. I'll, I'll, I'll never be happy. That's an argument. That's an argument that God wants to end today and saying, hey, you know what, let's stop this argument. Let me just go ahead and do this. Look what he does. He says, so God, everybody say, so God. So God. It says, so God took an oath when he made his promise. He wanted to make it very clear that his purpose does not what? Oh, my God. Listen, prior to being in ministry, I was an internal investigator. I have prosecuted so many people in court. And every single time I would go into the court, they would bring me into the box. And in this box, the judge and then the uh, uh, defendant's attorney would look at me, and then they would make sure that they would come up and they would say, lift up your right hand. And, and then once you lift that right hand, they would say, okay, today, do you promise to tell the whole truth? Nothing but the truth, so help you God. And they do a whole little spin. I'd be like, yep, I'm, I'm here to be a witness. I'm here to give my promise. And I'm here to give my oath that everything that I'm going to testify is real. It's true. And it's that oath that God says that he was willing to go in a box himself and make an oath before himself and say, I promise to do everything that I have promised you in that Bible. Yeah, praise the Lord, but we don't believe that, Lord. God himself made an oath. God himself made a promise. And God is not a man that he should lie. He is a God, when he makes a promise, he will do it. The problem with us, the church, is that we lack patience. And when something doesn't happen, like today, I'm sure many of you are going to leave me out of this place inspired and be like, yes, hope again. But come Wednesday, you're probably going to be like, dang, God didn't answer my prayer. Pastor lied. Nothing changed. Let me tell you something. When this Bible verse was written, this was people who not only just talked the talk, they had to live this out for their life. We, we only read it for a few minutes. And if it don't happen in a few minutes, man, we're tore up. Why ain't it happening? It's taking them time to see the breakthrough. And they're bringing revelation to you and I saying, hey, listen, God makes a promise. And he's not going to lie. Let's keep reading. So God took an oath and when he made his promise, he wanted to make it very clear the purpose that does not change. He wanted those who would receive what was promised to know that. He wants you to know that. Next verse. God took an oath so we would have good reason not to give up. That's why he did it. Why would God take an oath? Because he wants to give you a good reason not to give up. See, so many of us have a good reason why we should give up. God says, I'm going to give you a better reason why not to give up. Everybody say hope. Hope. We have run away from everything else to take hold of the hope offered to us in God's promise. So God gave his promise and his oath, and those two things can't change. He couldn't lie about them. Isn't that awesome? What verse are we on? Nobody listening? So God gave his promise and his oath. Those two things he can't change. He couldn't lie about them. Our hope is certain. Everybody say it. My hope is certain. It is something for the soul. Look at that. It is something for the soul to hold on to. It's some, everybody say hold on. It's, you know what your soul, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, when you finally know this hope, his name is Jesus, now your soul has something to hold on to that's secure, that's sure, that, that can't fail you, that won't let you drift. Why? Because there's something to hold on to. There's something to, to just, uh, just grab a hold of it. And you know what? I don't know about you, but whenever I'm sick, I always like to hug my pillow. Anybody like to hug something when you're sick? You just don't feel good. You're just like squeezing on something. You just need something to make you feel better. Well, that's what Jesus says. Hey, listen, when you're going through a struggle, hold on to me. When you're in the storm, hold on to me. And so he goes on to say, it goes all the way into the most holy room behind the curtain. That is where Jesus has gone. And he went there, look at this, and he went there to open the way 
ahead of us. God has already gone ahead of you to open the way for your healing, to open the way for your breakthrough. God has already went ahead of me. Before I get to Oaxaca, God already set everything in place for Elevate Church to be able to come in and bring relief and bring Jesus and bring healing and bring help. God has already made a way. You just can't see it right now. Our job is just to hope in the one who made the promise. Our job is to hope in the one who made an oath and said, I will not lie. Are you with me? And he has become a high priest forever, just like Melchizedek. Listen, we can't control what happens to us. We can't. Nobody here can control what happens to you. Okay, when I went through cancer, I couldn't control that I had cancer. I couldn't control that there was a mass in between my heart and my brain. I couldn't control. I had no power over that. The problem with us and hope is when we lose control, we lose hope. Why? Because we're naturally human nature. We want to we want to have control over every single little thing in our life. And the moment you lose control, we're out of control. And so Jesus comes in and he says, hey, listen, I am the anchor to your hope. And when you hope in me, I will make sure that you know clearly that I am secure in me and that I will keep you secure in whatever place or situation or circumstance you're in. And so I love the fact that we have the word of God that shows us so many amazing examples. Let's take Abraham. Remember, Abraham and Sarah, they're old people. They're old, man. Sarah's womb was, was dead. She couldn't have babies. Never. She could never have babies. She had a struggle. She always cried to God about having child. And, and then here you have God. God's talking to Abraham saying, Abri, I'm going to make you the father of faith to many. You will be the daddy of nations. I do. What do you mean be daddy of nations? I don't even have a kid. What do you mean daddy of nations? And then God says, oh, yeah, let's give you a kid. And so God promised Abraham a son by the name of what? Abraham. All right. Come on, theologian. Stay with me. And he said, I'm going to give you a son. <laughs> and Sarah's like, <laughs> and then he says, what are you laughing at, Sarah? She's like, oh, nothing. He's like, oh, no, you laugh, girl. You laugh. You laugh. You lying. You laugh. No, I didn't. Yep, saw you. And some of us, you know what? When God speaks a word that is bigger than you, we laugh. <laughs> but let me tell you something. God gets the last laugh. And so God tells Abraham in his old age, and he tells Sarah, who has a dead womb and is old, he says, girl, you're going to have a little baby. You're going to have a boy, and you shall name him Isaac, and he shall be the promise, etc., etc. Ain't going to get into that sermon. But here's what we failed to see. Do you know when God made the oath, when God made that promise, it took 28 years before they birthed Isaac? Man, some of us can't even wait 28 minutes in a church service because we're already looking at our clocks. <laughs> when God makes an oath, when God makes a promise, he keeps his word. We need to hope. The Bible says this, and this is about Abraham and, 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 and Sarah. It says, against all hope, they hoped again. What's against you right now? Because against all hope, they hoped again. Why do I say that? Because you know what? Some of us like me, there's times like when I went to Mexico, we did everything we did. I was like, yeah! Kick that devil butt and then boom, earthquake yesterday. I was so mad. I was like, oh, why? Mauricio, you can't control it. You know what you have to do? You need to hope again. Because there will be times where you're in, you're in the rhythm, something happens. You got to hope again. Hope again. But you don't know what I'm going through. Hope again. But you don't know what I've been through. Hope again. But I've lost everything. Hope again. But it's cray cray. Hope again. Hope again. Against all hope, I hoped again. Let me give you two definitions of hope. Or hope and faith, because I think this is where we confuse it. Hope is, no, 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 no. The other one, guys, come on. Hope is my assurance. Let's make that clear real fast. Hope is my assurance. Hope is, faith is not my assurance. 
hope. Read Hebrews 11. Go back and read it. We, we're misinterpreting the Bible. Hope is my assurance. Hope is what makes certain. Faith is my action. Faith is action. Hope is my assurance. So when I come to a place of hope, like I hope that our church can do something about Oaxaca. I came and I brought the hope to Elevate Church. I said, church, let's hope for Houston. Let's hope for Oaxaca. And then we all came together and we did something magnificent. We raised enough funds to do something awesome and leave an impact in Oaxaca to where now there's a ministry that's birthing out of all this that's going to help people globally. It's amazing. I even believe that God's even going to start a relief team in Elevate Church where for every catastrophic situation uh, in the world, we will send Elevate in some way. That's bigger than me. I don't know how that's going to work, but it's, someone's going to, we already have the team here somewhere. Just come tell me who you are. Because <laughs> I can't keep going. <laughs> no, we need, we, need, we, need, we need hope that people will rise. And so what happened? So I brought hope. And then our faith went to action. You get this? Now put the definition of hope. Hope is a constant. Read it all together. One, two, three. Hope. Hope is a constant expectation that God is working even when I can't sense him, even when I can't feel him, even when I can't see him, even when I can't see nothing changing, when I see her, she ain't changing, when I see him, he ain't changing, when I, it, it, listen, hope is just constant, you're always expecting, just let me give you an example, a farmer, a farmer, when he plants his seed in the ground, he doesn't treat it like a like a funeral service. I mean, can you imagine? Just picture this. The farmer comes with his seeds. And he says, Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today for my good friend, the seed. And I'm so heartbroken <laughs> that today I lay my seed to rest. Oh, seed. How faithful you were in my bucket. And now, I shall never see you again. Heck to the no, that's not what a farmer does. When a farmer farms, you know what he does? Man, he's hoping for the greatest harvest ever. Hope is like your seed. Hope is a seed. Hope is saying, you know what, what is it that you are hoping that will take place? And you begin to hope that, you know what, God, as I plant this seed in you, as my anchor is in you, as my trust is in you, I am hoping for the greatest expectation that I have ever seen in my life. We need hope again. No farmer farms without expecting something awesome. That's what God is saying to us. Hey, listen, I want you to start expecting the best when you're at your worst. I want you to start talking. That was really the word. God saying, talk crazy in the worst situation. Just start saying, you know what? Man, this is going to be amazing. What do you mean it's amazing? You're crazy, man. This is bad. Oh, no. This is going to be like ridiculously awesome. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. Right now, you know what? Our, our, our kids are gone crazy. You know what? What if we just start saying, you know what? Man, my kids, they're going to be sitting with me in the front row. We're going to be worshiping God. Oh, my, my kids? <laughs> yeah, they're a little cray-cray right now. But they're going to be cray-cray for Jesus? Dang. You know what? My kid right now is so far gone or, or, or my, my family is a mess or, or my health. Man, I am literally deteriorating. You know what? How about change the lingo and say, you know what? <laughs> bless, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and bless all that is within him. Bless his holy name and do not forget his benefits. Come on. I have expectation that he who has begun a good work in me, he is faithful to finish that. What if you just started speaking and prophesying over every single place in your life and you started declaring that the best is yet to be. While we were in Oaxaca, we had to speak hope, guys. Listen, you are a hope dealer. 
Some of you used to sell drugs. We'll sell hope for free 99. Be the, be the greatest hope dealer that this earth has ever seen. God will bring you into places that no man can get into. God will put you in situations that no man can set you up for. God will set up interventions that no one can do for you. God's saying hope again, hope again. You are my hope dealer. You are the hope to the world. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Now bring some flavor. Hope again. Hope again. It's not looking good. That's not what I see. It's looking awesome. No, dude, dude, put on your glasses. I don't wear glasses. We're, we're standing in the same room. This person is dying. No, I see the life of Jesus coming in. I see the breath of God coming in again. Hope deferred makes the heart sick is what Proverbs says. Stop putting your hope on layaway. Because Jesus paid the price. It's yours. Hope again. Two more points. Let's get out of here. Can I give you two more points? Against all hope. Hope again. <laughs> so Paul. Paul's telling the church, hey, listen. You want big promises? How many here want a big promise from God? No, for real. Don't be lying in church, okay? Don't, if you don't believe. How many want a big promise from God? Seriously, how many want a big promise? Well, let me tell you something. With a big promise is a big problem. It's going to be a big problem. That's okay. That's what hope's for. Hope sustains you. Hope inspires you. Hope motivates you. Hope challenges you. Hope consumes you. You see, it just starts with, God, I'm just going to, you just start talking God's language, and you know what, all of a sudden, it's not even about you anymore. The Spirit of God himself is activated. And once his Spirit is activated within you, you've already done your part. Now the Spirit does the next step. He just needs a person that is saying, I can hope in the midst of seeing rubble. God says, girl, if you can go ahead and just, just accept the fact that, yes, you may be in the rubble, but revival is on its way, and revival is going to be inside of you. You see, I can't help what happened to me, but I can help what's going to come through me. Hope is coming through me. Easier said than done, but it's happening. Hope is coming. Faith is rising. It won't be long. Hold fast. Paul says, come on, church, wake up. Wake up. Enough of this little wishy-washy Christianity, and let's start putting an anchor in Jesus. Point number one, write this down. Why do you need an anchor? That's what he said. He says, and this is secure in me. He said, I'm the anchor. Number one, the anchor keeps your boat from drifting. The anchor keeps your boat from drifting. Now, I know you're probably thinking, oh, there he goes. He's going to be like them preachers. When the storm has come, the anchor. Oh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw, throw you for a little loop. No. Recently, I went fishing. I like bass fishing. My birthday's coming up, by the way, October 20th. I love fishing and motorcycle driving. Just a little hint. Leave it right there. But anyways, we went fishing, and I have a little 14-foot aluminum boat. It's a, just a little fishing boat. No big deal. If you have a bass boat, I'll take it. But anyways, uh, aluminum boat. Stay focused, Mauricio. So we're on this aluminum boat, Anthony and I, and, and let me tell you something. The waters were like crystal glass. It was just like calm. And I forgot that I didn't have an anchor. And I looked at Anthony and I said, because we fought this sweet spot. We found the sweet spot. The fish were like taunting us, jumping out all around the boat, and, and we can catch like nothing. But I said to him, hey, dude, don't worry. You know what? The water is still, man. We're, we're like, we're in a cove, and the water's like glass. It's going, ain't going nowhere. Well, we'd be fishing before you knew it. Knew it. We were already drifted somewhere else. You see, don't think that the only time you need an anchor is when you're in a storm. 
No, things can be calm right now in your life, yet you are drifting from God. Don't think that I got to wait for a storm in order for me to be anchored. You, No, no, listen. Stay anchored now because even in the calm, you and I can come to a place called complacency. You and I can come to a place where you start putting up with apathy. You and I can come to a place where we just start accepting average. You are not an average Christian. You are a hope dealer. You are not an average believer. You are a faith maker. Amen? You make things happen. You move mountains. You got to speak to those mountains, not talk about your mountains. Come on. The only rubble that you and I should see is the rubble that we're proclaiming and the mountain comes down. That's the rubble that we speak. That's the rubble that we want to see come down are the things that are keeping us from God's presence, the things that are keeping us from the hope of glory. And his name is Jesus. Second point, and let's go home. An anchor provides stability in the storm. An anchor provides stability in the storm. The way you stay ready for a storm is you have to stay grounded and anchored in Jesus all the time. Don't wait for a catastrophic moment in your life to try to hook up. Why? Because when the storms and the waters are moving, let me tell you something, it's not as easy to latch on. Latch on to Jesus today. Latch on today. Maybe you have no storm, but let me tell you something. You can be still and you can be drifting right now. We're not drifting. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.